Welcome to class. I'm Trevor and I post D&D videos every week, generally on Wednesdays. This is the last in my D&D Basics series that covers how to read the character sheet. All that I have left is the personality traits section, that kind of role play section in the top right hand corner of the character sheet. That's personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. This is the framework in fifth edition for how to role play your selected character. Now, before I get into uh, the different ways you can come up with this mechanically, at least like based on the books that are provided. I want to say that there's a lot of flexibility here. There's a lot of flexibility in how your character behaves. The world is your oyster. And you can approach your character's personality and their ideals, bonds, and flaws in a lot of different ways. You can come up with an archetype or like an idea of a character that you want to play in your game and make your character based off of that. Pick a background that fits and pick these different things that fit for that character. I'll show a concrete example of that at the end of this video. You can make your stats, like roll your stats or come up with your stats, however your table does, and then based on your stats, develop a personality. That's fine too. You can pick a background, and at least in the player's handbook, each background has tables that you can roll on, and you can make a random personality. There's a lot of different options here, and none of them are wrong, but I do want to remind you, at least preemptively, if that's still considered a reminder, that personality can change over time. Your character does not need to be a one-dimensional static character that lives up to this fantasy that you have from session zero. As you're like progress in the game and role play out experiences and go through things, your character's personality will very likely change. And I think that that is a good thing. Now, let's get into the character sheet. That first section in the top right of the character sheet is personality traits, and it's the most self-explanatory one. This is a really brief bio of your character, what they do well, what they do poorly. It can be a string of adjectives. It can be a couple of sentences. It can even be something tied to either your stats or the random tables you rolled or the character that you based your character off of. There's a lot of uh, flexibility here. It's very open-ended, but it's just something that you can look at as a reminder for how your character might behave in any particular situation. Situation. The three under this, ideals, bonds, and flaws, get into more specifics about your character's behavior. Let's talk about ideals. Ideals are that foundation for your character. You might want to consider the following questions that are outlined in the player's handbook. What are the principles that your character will never betray? What would prompt you to make a sacrifice, or your character, to make a sacrifice in the moment? What drives your character and guides them toward their actions or their end goals. Like I said earlier, there are tables in the player's handbook per background where you can roll for this or you can just use them for ideas. Later in this video, I'm gonna show uh, something similar with the backgrounds provided in the Ben Richten's guide, the newest book that just released. Now let's get on to bonds. Bonds is the next part of the role playing side of the character sheet, and it's what your character is tied to. There are some questions that you can ask yourself for this as well. Whom does your character care about the most? To what place do you feel a personal connection? And what is your most treasured possession? I love these questions for bonds specifically, because when I'm thinking of a character, I normally only think of bonds related to other people. That might say something about me. But your character can be bonded to a place or an item or even a concept, I think. And those things are just as important as bonds that we might have to people. So keep that in mind when you're coming up with your character's bonds. Now, let's get on to flaws. The last part of the role-playing section of the character sheet is flaws. What enrages your character? What one person makes your character the most scared and horrified and, and just elicits this kind of numbing reaction from them? What is your character or are your character's vices? What are your character's fears? and those might be related to flaws directly or indirectly. This helps round out your character. It makes them more dynamic and it makes them a bit more complex and realistic as a human. They're not going to be flawless because no human is flawless. They might be too devoted to their cause, although that sounds kind of like the cliche response to the interview question about what your biggest flaw is. But I think it's important to really consider this question because it helps to uh, guide your character's behavior, especially in the more tricky situations, right? If they're terrified of something, then overcoming it might be uh, a whole goal for your character long-term. 
But I think that all of this, all three of these aspects of the character sheet are really well done for fifth edition. It's kind of interesting how much they boiled down what it means to be a person into just ideals, bonds, and flaws. But I think it really works. And they gave a lot of resources for how to come up with those things. And that's what we're gonna get into now. So the last thing I wanna do in this video is go through one of the ways that I would make a character and that my table tends to make characters. Um, sometimes we'll just do it randomly or we'll do it based on scores, but a lot of the time we'll come up with an archetype or a character concept and then build our character based off of that. And I'm a teacher and I've always really had fun thinking about characters in literature as D&D characters. So the character that I'm going to come up with is Hamlet, the prince, not the dead king. Although you could do that as well. And I'm going to use the tables from Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, like I mentioned earlier, to flesh out Hamlet's background. Now, the specific background that I would pick is the Haunted One background, but there's a lot of other ones that you could certainly use for this character. So let's talk about Hamlet's personality traits. In that table, in Van Richten's Guide, we have the one that fits Hamlet the best would be number seven. It doesn't matter if the whole world's against me, I'll always do what I think is right. And that concept fits perfectly for Hamlet. All of Denmark thinks that Claudius is the reasonable, justified king, and Hamlet believes that Claudius murdered his father and usurped the throne. So I think that that is a perfect kind of a guiding principle or personality for Hamlet's character, especially in the beginning of the play. Now let's look at ideals. On the ideals table, ideal number nine, promise, works the best for my take on this character. My life is no longer my own. I must fulfill the dream of someone who's gone. The entire play of Hamlet is based on Hamlet getting back the legacy of his father. His father died unjustly, and no one seems to care enough, and Hamlet wants people to remember and value his father as much as he does. So this promise, this pact that he makes with his, his father's ghost in Act 1 is really what kind of guides him on the rest of the play. Now let's get into Hamlet's bond, and you might see where I'm going with this. Number 12 is the best bond for Hamlet. I lost someone I care about, but I still see them in guilty visions, recurring dreams, or as a spirit. I love this specifically because... There's an argument to be made that later in the play, in Act 3, when Hamlet sees his father's ghosts in his mother's room, that the ghost isn't actually there. I'm not going to go off on too much of a tangent and get into the kind of literary criticism or analysis of that, but it is possible. Gertrude doesn't see Ham the King Hamlet's ghost there. And this concept, I would play into this. I would lean into this as I was playing the character and potentially... If I was playing Hamlet in actual campaign, he would see his father's ghost more often than just the one time that happens in the actual play. Now, the last thing is flaws. And Hamlet's flaws would be, his best flaw would be number 10. I am exceptionally cautious, planning laboriously and devising countless contingencies. And I think that works the best for Hamlet. All of the play, the entire play, is number 10, is that like overly thoughtful to a degree uh, analysis paralysis that Hamlet falls into. There's an argument to be made, though, that number 12 could also work. I know the ends always justify the means, and I'm quick to make sacrifices to attain my goals. I'm mentioning this because, like I mentioned earlier, personalities change, characters develop, and I think that that would be a good place to take Hamlet. As the play continues, Hamlet goes from being a victim of his analysis to being a little literal murderer. He kills Polonius and he kills Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Spoilers for a really old play if you've never read it. But like that is only justified in his mind because my thoughts be bloody or be nothing worth. He needs that. He needs to start acting because he's been lollygagging too much. He hasn't gotten enough accomplished. So I like reading over this list because even if I picked that number 10 one first, I might... At some point, if, if it makes sense in the narrative of the game that I'm playing, I might change the way that I'm playing this character because it, it would fit, it makes sense, right? And obviously as I'm playing in a game, maybe my version of Hamlet in the campaign that I'm playing doesn't pan out the same way as the character that is in the play, in the source material. And I think that that is completely acceptable, right? We're reinventing and reimagining these things when we create them in our campaigns. But it's it's a great starting off point because characters in literature are so rich and so complex that it gives you something dynamic to work with and knobs to turn and things like that. So hopefully this helps 
kind of unpack and make sense of that very flavorful role-playing side of the character sheet. And now after all of these videos, the character sheet should make a lot more sense. If you have any questions or kind of concerns about how to read a character sheet or anything is calculated, please drop them in the comments down below. I really love getting people into this hobby or answering questions and making, making people feel more comfortable about playing their games or creating their characters or whatever the case may be. But as I always say, be safe, make smart life choices.